Hello and welcome. I'm Phil Torres, here to talk about innovations that can change lives. We're going to explore the intersection of hardware and humanity, and we're doing it in a unique way. This is a show about science by scientists. Let's check out our team of hardcore nerds. Lindsay Moran is an ex-CIA operative. She's got a real-life medical drama, a face transplant that almost ended in death, and the innovation that saved a remarkable woman's life. Rochelle Oldmixon is a neuroscientist. She's in the mountains of California where condors are making a comeback thanks to a simple use of technology. And I'm Phil Torres, I'm an entomologist. I study insects in the rainforest of Peru. That's our team, now let's do some science. Hey guys, welcome back to another week of life-changing innovations in science. We're starting today with Lindsay. You have an incredible, touching story of a transformation in a woman to get a face transplant. Tell me the story of this woman. Well, this was truly a life-changing use of technology for this woman. Her name's Carmen Tarleton, and she had a full face transplant. Here's the procedure. I want to emphasize that this is still very cutting edge technology. There have only been seven face transplants in the United States. Carmen's was the seventh. And there have only been 30 full or partial face transplants worldwide. Carmen took an incredible risk even having this procedure done. And by doing that, she actually is helping to change the way that they look at face transplants in the future and really changing medicine. I was an ordinary registered nurse, another of two in my second marriage. Before I was attacked, well, I considered myself a, a good-looking person, an average-looking person. I didn't appreciate having physical looks that sort of matched and went along with everybody else. Carmen's nightmare began in this house in Vermont on a quiet June evening in 2007. Carmen was in the midst of divorcing her husband when he broke in, tied her up, beat her with a bat, and then doused her body with a bottle filled with industrial lye. One doctor described it as the most horrific injury a human could suffer. 80% of Carmen's body was burned. She was left legally blind, and despite 55 surgeries over five years, her face and neck remained grossly disfigured and terribly painful. Dr. Pomahawk came and sat down across from you and said that you were a, a candidate for a face transplant. I was stunned. I, I, was, I was shocked that, uh, that this could even be done. At the time, she told the Boston Globe about her decision. If there's a possibility, you know, and I feel that it's worth it, then, then, then I'll do it. You waited 14 months. Tell me about when you got the call saying that they had a match. Dr. Tonhawk called me and said it wasn't a perfect match. She was a little older than I was interested in. I didn't want to wait any longer. I'd waited a long time, and I said yes. Carmen's 15 hours of surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston began with a team to recover the donor's face, a 56-year-old woman who died of a stroke. With only four hours before the donor's face would no longer be viable, Carmen's surgical team connected the donor's nerves, blood vessels, and muscles onto Carmen's face, then reconnected bones to make the face and neck fit properly. Before doctors even made a single incision, Carmen was warned of a potentially life-threatening complication. She'd had so many skin grafts and blood transfusions from unknown donors, doctors feared that her immune system would launch a full-scale attack on her new face and it actually did. For weeks afterwards, they pumped Carmen with every drug they could think of, but nothing worked. We were literally on the last uh, medication. Should she be given full dose, could shut down her immune system. I told him that he needs to give me the drug. The risk of death was significant. And I want this face to work out. So I said, I'm gonna do whatever, whatever I have to do. 
But to my surprise, Carmen said, I would rather die than going back. I just don't want to go back. That's a powerful statement that I honestly didn't expect. If they couldn't get the rejection under control, they'd have to remove the transplant, leaving Carmen with yet another mutilated face. With the clock ticking, doctors made a significant break with protocol. We gave a small dose of that medication to Carmen uh, that we felt was not going to paralyze the immune system, but uh, could help. It was a powerful anti-rejection drug, alemtuzumab, but they gave her just a fraction of the prescribed dose. And turned out that that was the last little bit that uh, she needed. Yeah, you look great. I think the color is good. You look good. Yeah, I feel good. Maybe we come down on some of the medications. OK. Now, six months later, living proof of a small change with a huge Hi. impact, not just for Carmen, okay. but other high-risk transplant patients dealing with rejection. Back home in Vermont, Carmen is literally getting comfortable in her skin. Carmen, would you mind if I touch your face? No, I don't mind. Do. <laughs> <laughs> it's smooth. So this is all part of the transplant. Right. How far back does the transplant go? This is the line around here, down here, and then all the way up the other side. What are your goals now? My goal now is to have a face that works at least 90% of normal within another year and a half. Are there specific things you feel like you can't do with this face that you want to be able to do? I can't show expression yet. And now I can move my lips and I can smile. It takes time to use her muscles that I that I no longer had. I'm gonna sort of like wiggle my nose. So she has daily facial exercises. And Carmen still needs to take immunosuppressants. How many different pills do you have to take a day? 10 different kinds, but about 40 something pills. Carmen's also written a book, Overcome, Burned, Blinded, and Blessed. Tell me about what message you wanted to convey. I knew if people could see how far I'd come, that they might take that chance to get past and to overcome some of their demons so they wouldn't have to live in such a negative place. <laughs> what an amazing woman an incredible procedure that they went through. What sort of complications did those doctors find? The complications were that she'd had so many skin grafts from unknown donors that her immune system would attack this new face. They tried every kind of drug imaginable and then finally came up with the, the miracle and that seemed to work. And so it really ch has changed the way that doctors like Dr. Pomahawk, who performed Carmen's face transplant, are dealing with the aftermath of these procedures. So we've seen kind of the medical aspect of Carmen's story, but what about the people who are in her life? How did this affect them? The people surrounding Carmen, both before the attack and after, are truly amazing people like she is herself. As she continues to regain the use of her face, Carmen has some personal goals. I know you had a goal of being able to kiss your boyfriend, Sheldon. Have you been able to do that? <laughs> he kisses me, and I try, but I not. I don't kiss him the way I want to. <laughs> a big part of her life now, music teacher Sheldon Stein, who she met just before the surgery. She came to the music store before her face transplant, so she was a sight to see. And even the first day I saw how strong a person she was inside, her inner beauty attracted me. What was your reaction when you first saw her new face? I held her hand and stared at her, <laughs> honestly. It was like just mind-boggling and amazing. That's easy. Twinkle. Pretty good, huh? Amazing is right. The face Sheldon is admiring on Carmen came from a 56-year-old Massachusetts woman whose death gave Carmen her new life. You knew that 
your getting a face was going to mean a tremendous loss for somebody else. I knew that there was somebody out there. She had no idea it was going to be her. I knew that she was going to leave family. I knew it was going to be unexpected. On February 13th, Carmen finally got word that a donor face had been found. Tell me about the significance of the date. By the time I had surgery, it was Valentine's Day. And to me, Valentine's Day is the day of love and it's the day of gifts. I felt strongly that it was a gift for me from her. Carmen and Lindsay, Thelma, oh. Thelma and Louise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are off to Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Was it an early morning drive when you went down to get the transplant? That was in the middle of the night at 1.30 in the morning. It was very quiet, nobody on the road. It's real surreal. That night, 50 miles away, Cheryl Donnelly Ryder was in a coma, kept alive by machines after a massive stroke. Tell me a little bit about your mom, Cheryl. She was a free spirit, a force of nature, beautiful, very selfless woman. Cheryl was already a registered organ donor, but Marinda was stunned by what doctors told her. It was brought to my attention that there was a possibility that she could be a match for a facial transplant. And I was, that kind of, you know, blew my mind a little bit. You knew this was what your mom would have wanted? Definitely. Did you want to know who the donor was? I did want to know who the donor was, and initially they told me nothing other than her age. I was aware that it would be the family's choice whether or not to meet me. In most of the face transplants, the donors have remained anonymous or respectfully distant. But when Carmen first met her donor's daughter, Marinda, the connection was overwhelming for both women. So Carmen, you officially have paparazzi now. <laughs> The first public view of their incredible bond came hours after they met. Carmen, you look beautiful. Thank you. I looked at her through the glass, and I could see her profile, and it very much looked like my mother's face if she had been stung by a bee or it was swollen. I'm going to come over and hug you one more time. She came towards me. She had an aura about her that was just sweet and beautiful and loving. And then, like, seeing her was just a wave of emotion. And, like, we, Carmen, myself, and my mother were all there just embracing each other. Um, it was pretty spectacular. You're beautiful. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Looking at these pictures, I can see why you have such a, an emotional reaction when you see Carmen, because this, that truly is her face. Yeah, I know, right? It's, it's wild. There's a similarity, too, when Carmen, before her accident, I can see they, they almost look like sisters. Talk about a match. That match is more than just skin deep, as an emotional Marinda waited to see Carmen the day we were there. Hi. Oh, my gosh, it's so oh good, good to see you. You look great. Oh, thank you. Your yeah, lips are... you haven't seen me in a while. No, yeah. I know. Oh. Wow. You look beautiful. No, thank you. And I can move a little bit, like I can smile. Yeah. Oh, my God. A little <laughs> smile. Wow. Can you actually, like, feel that, too? Yeah. My mom had, like, we call it the Dinelli smirk. And we kind of oh, figured that okay. that would kind of, like, maybe come back. Maybe, like that's, yes. yeah. Was it, like, one-sided? Yeah. What side was it? It was, I think it was the right, the right side. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. See if I can smirk. Yeah. How does it make you feel that you were able to facilitate such a profound difference and a profound improvement in someone's life? The word I used the first time I met Carmen was elated. I felt elated. I felt like this was all meant to be. There's the, the obvious connection that Carmen has your mother's face, but there's more than that. Tell us why you two are so connected. 
I mean, who would ever think that you would ever get to touch your loved one's face after they pass? So, you know, Carmen's just so open. What do you think your mom would think now about Carmen having her face and the two of you meeting here? She's proud. Yeah, she's, she's happy. happy. She's happy. Oh, so good to see you. Yeah, you too. That is just an unbelievable story that you got to experience. So what does she see as next for her life? If we check back with Carmen in about six months, she'll probably look very different because the face takes a while to kind of settle on the bone structure of the person. Eventually, Carmen's face will look kind of like a hybrid of her and of, of Cheryl, Marinda's mother. Her strength just, it made me cry. Watching it was really moving. You will never meet a more resilient person than Carmen Tarleton. It was beautiful to watch. So, Rochelle, you got the opportunity to cover a technology story that was completely different completely. than what Lindsay did. Please <laughs> tell me about different. this. The California condor was practically extinct. We started to use technology to bring them back and sort of foster an increase in their population. Close up, the California condor is pretty ugly. It's a vulture, essentially. So it's not the most beautiful bird close up, but when it's flying, it's absolutely gorgeous. At one point, the population was down to about 22 birds total. And it's all because of the lead shot in bullets. Because humanity sort of took them to the brink of extinction, we're now working to bring the California condor back to its original population levels. So why don't we check it out? In flight, it impresses, majestic as it sails through the skies, strong and steady. It's the largest flying bird in North America, capable of cruising 55 miles an hour and traveling 150 miles in a single day. Because California condors can cover such impressive distances, they're hard to keep track of. I head out to Kern County, California to Bitter Creek National Wildlife Refuge to meet up with Jeffrey Grisdell and his team with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the federal agency leading the charge to save the species. Ready? Ready. Today, the team is doing some hands-on work with the endangered birds. It's really exciting to be here today because it's very, very rare to see them in this kind of setting. They're very social, very amicable creatures. The birds are caught twice a year for a health check and to get some new high-tech hardware. So two of the devices that we use for monitoring California condors are this solar-powered GPS unit and then this VHF transmitter. So I'm gonna put this transmitter right up against where it's coming out of the bird's body. Does it affect the way that they fly? This thing is, is, is really tiny. It doesn't, it doesn't weigh very much. It doesn't really get in the way of, of their flying. This is called a Yagi antenna. The gear used to pick up the frequencies is a bit old school. It pinpoints a specific bird out in the open, but it's the GPS that is the bird's lifeline to survival. And they're monitored here at the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research. Okay, so welcome to our spatial ecology lab. This is where we process and analyze all of the data that we get from the condors that we're tracking in the wild. The Institute monitors 30 condors that now call Baja California home. So here we've got over 100,000 GPS location fixes. This is the reintroduction site, but we found that the birds are actually moving over to the eastern side because this side gets the sun first thing in the morning. So that desert heats up, creates those strong thermal winds that the birds like to soar around with. So that's something that we didn't see, that we didn't know about until we got the data from the GPS tag. So it's a fantastic example of how technology is really driving the field of ecology now. In less than three decades, the progress made with the California condor has been fantastic. There are 429 condors alive today, with over half of them in the wild. Dr. Mike Wallace, condor program manager, has dedicated his career to saving the species. There were about 22 left when you started the program, right? Yes. 22, and we're now up to uh, well over 400 birds in, in the world. In 30 years? Yes. How'd you do that? Well, we, we uh, manipulated the breeding rate of the birds. California condors typically have a slow reproductive rate. Females lay one egg at a time, but if something happens to it, 
they'll produce another. It's called double clutching. Taking advantage of Mother Nature's plan, eggs are carefully confiscated. The chicks are then hatched and cared for by humans with as little interaction as possible. When the chicks get old enough, they get released into the wild. This is why after so much time and effort, losing a bird is a huge setback, especially losing a bird to lead poisoning, a leading killer of condors. The thing that's most disheartening is the lead poisoning because again, it's man-caused. We're putting them into extinction. As part of nature's cleaning crew, California condors eat dead animals. They often feast on game killed by hunters using lead bullets. And when they accidentally eat a bullet fragment, that lead poison gets into their systems. Thank you. Today, there are a number of releases. But number 513 isn't one of the lucky ones. He needs medical treatment because of lead poisoning. One last California condor release of the day, and the privilege was mine. A little bit and start to st slowly stand up, and then we're gonna shift the bird so that it's gonna come up. That was kind of terrifying. I'm shaking, but it was really exciting. It was kind of fun to see her fly off. What do you see for the future of the California condor? There's been millions of dollars put in this program since the beginning. Would you argue that it's worth it? Yeah, I, I, would, I would argue that it's worth it. You have to draw the line somewhere. We're not going to accept that letting animals go extinct is okay. So, Rochelle, first off, I must say, I'm pretty impressed that you could pick that thing up. I've worked in conservation biology quite a bit. And there's this term called the extinction vortex, mm -hmm. where basically a population can get below a threshold, and once it gets to that number, it can't really fully recover because there isn't enough genetic diversity. So, I mean, you told me this got down to 22 yeah. individuals. Honestly, I'm a little skeptical that even though the numbers are high now, that there's enough diversity in there for the species to sustain. The 22 that were captured and bred are very diverse genetically. So they were specifically paired to breed in such a way that it would create the most genetic diversity. And now they have a genetics program where they actually figure out which population the bird should go to when it's released in order to increase that genetic diversity because it's a big concern, you're right. Thank you guys for sharing those stories. Lindsay, that was just a life-inspiring story. And Rochelle, now I'm excited. I wanna go see a condor and there's enough of them that hopefully I can actually see one. Techno's world never stops. Dive deep into these stories and go behind the scenes at aljazeera.com slash techno. Follow our expert contributors on Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, and more.